What's up everybody? Today we're going over anterior compartment syndrome. So there's a bunch of different compartment syndromes that can show up in the body, but this is the one the board wants to care about the most because it's on the anterior part of the leg, which would include like the tibialis anterior, all of our extensor as of our toes and everything, dorsiflexors, whatnot. Those are the ones that are primarily affected by anterior compartment syndrome. So let's get into it. So anatomy, let's talk about the anatomy of the lower leg. So it's the front part of the lower leg. So we're going to see that the muscles that we would see that are uh, swollen, inflamed, becoming paresthesias, weakness, numbness, tingling, all of that. The muscles that are affected by this are the tibialis anterior, that's our primary dorsiflexor, our extensor hallucis longus, that's what extends our big toe, our extensor digitorum longus, which extends all the other toes, and our peroneus tertius, which remember, that is one of our peroneals located on the anterior part of the ankle. So that's what's affected. So what's happening here is that we're having lots of swelling and edema and pressure, which is gonna cause compression of the capillaries. So we're losing our blood supply. Uh, the muscles are going to be squished and the nerves are going to be squished. So with compartment syndrome, everything is getting squished in the front part of the leg. And so the nerve that's affected would be the deep branch of the peroneal nerve, which is responsible for intervening our dorsiflexors and our ex extensor digitorum longus and EHL. All of those are affected with anterior compartment syndrome. And what happens is with that swelling, we're having compression of the capillaries. The capillaries supply the muscle and the nerve which would then cause ischemia to the air. Remember, ischemia is a blockage of blood flow, which would cause death to the nerves, the muscles. That's why we're having weakness, numbness, tingling, all of that stuff when it comes to uh, anterior compartment syndrome. So essentially not good, not good. Our leg has stopped working because it's all swollen and everything. So swelling in the anterior compartment of the lower leg is what will cause compartment syndrome, especially anterior compartment syndrome. This happens due to any sort of trauma. So I'm thinking like traumatic, like trauma in the sense of falls, any sort of fractures, um, motor vehicle accidents, all those fall under trauma. Also in a subcategory under trauma would be surgery because we're cutting into the fascia of the, you know, muscle and everything. Uh, so not good at all. That's going to be causing it as well. Increased swelling, all those problems post-surgical, just blown out of proportion. The leg just swells up. And then overexertion can also cause anterior compartment syndrome. And this is because chronic compartment syndrome happens secondary to overexertion due to exercise. So let's talk about the difference between acute compartment syndrome and chronic compartment syndrome. So when it comes to um, acute compartment syndrome, this is a medical emergency. So acute compartment syndrome, like quick onset, leg all of a sudden starts swelling like crazy, bad. This is the one that happens secondary to any sort of trauma to the leg. So when we see that, this is what's causing the ischemia to the anterior compartment, causing the death of muscles and nerves to the area, which if that's all happening, we could lose the leg and then require an amputation. So essentially, if we start seeing this onset very, very quickly with all of this ischemia to the anterior compartment due to like a motor vehicle accident, some trauma, fall, whatnot, we're thinking, ah, bad, not good at all because we don't want to lose function or innervation to uh, anterior compartment. Now, chronic compartment syndrome, on the other hand, happens secondary to any sort of exertion. So usually due to sports. So we're seeing, you know, athletic induced onset of chronic compartment syndrome. So this is just, you're doing okay. You exercise a little too hard. Your leg swells up there and then it kind of goes back down. This is one that kind of, it's essentially an exacerbation rather than a continuous just ballooning. So this is not a medical emergency most of the time. So I always say most of the time, but in regards to the boards, they're gonna care more about that acute compartment syndrome because that's one where we're like, oh crap, let's send them to the ER. Chronic compartment syndrome is something you need to be familiar with for treatment, understanding that patients might suffer from this and just kind of understanding what would cause an exacerbation of symptoms similar to like increased overexertion and stuff would cause exacerbations with MS patients. So what does it look like? So we see that this patient, their right leg, so our left, their right, um, is very swollen. If you're listening to this on the podcast, check out the YouTube channel uh, so you can see this uh, video, so you can see what it looks like. So you can see it's shiny, it's swollen, it's really just ballooned up in this anterior compartment of the knee. We can see, especially along the muscle belly of the tibialis anterior right up here, 
we can see that's really swelled up. And that is due to the fact that this patient is suffering from anterior compartment syndrome, specifically of the right leg. So we see all this increased edema and swelling, especially along the anterior aspect of the leg. Now, again, it could wrap around to the backside. There is such thing as posterior compartment syndrome. It's literally just which cross section of the leg ends up uh, getting swollen. So we can see over here, the bottom left hand corner, we have a cross section of the leg. So it's like a transverse split kind of thing through the leg. And we can see that there's different compartments here. You can see the anterior compartment has the tibialis anterior. That's the big one up there. We can see our extensor hallucis longus um, and then our uh, extensor digitorum longus. We can see all those muscles kind of showing up here. And so that's on the anterior compartment. This is the part of the leg that will continue to swell. So it's the meaty part of the leg that's going to be um, lateral to the tibia. So we can see that that could be swelling. We see the posterior compartment could also swell in some places, but we're talking about anterior for this one because that's what the board cares about the most. So they're going to pick one. They're going to pick anterior compartment. We're going to see tightness and tenderness to the tissue. That is why it starts becoming shiny and stretched out. It almost kind of looks like, I don't even know how to say it. It looks like someone like poured some water on it and there's like some, some like shine going on with it or whatever it is. You wax a car. That's kind of how it looks like. So um, that's just due to the fact that we have increase, um, swelling to the area that's kind of making the tissue more taut. Think about if you're filling up a water balloon, it starts getting more tighter. You can't really move it too much. It's like getting really, really, really thick. Think of like a, a physio ball when you blow it up, the more you blow it up, like less uh, room it has to be squishy and it's more tight. That's what's going on in your legs. So not good at all. And as I said before, specifically over the tibialis anterior in the muscle belly of the tibialis anterior, because that's what takes up the most space in the anterior compartment. So that's the one that gets hit with the swelling the most. And we can see that you'll have the paresthesia. So, you know, like the, the numbness and tingling and the weakness and everything um, and numbness as well along the deep peroneal nerve distribution. Understand with anterior compartment syndrome, the nerve that's mainly affected is the deep peroneal nerve. So the deep branch of the peroneal nerve, I guess what it's called the fibular nerve sometimes, but I prefer peroneal. I don't care. I'm going to call it peroneal. Um, and so that is the one that is going to be affected because that innervates all of these muscles on the anterior portion of the leg. So that's also why I tell you guys when you're learning nerves to compartmentalize things, because then when you have something like compartment syndrome, you kind of know which things are affected by which. And by compartment compartmentalize things, I mean like see which muscles are all innervated by the same nerve and just group things together to make it easy. If you need help with grouping, there's a freebie on our website that talks about, well, essentially the freebie groups every single nerve together. So check that out if you need um, some extra help with grouping nerves, but back to compartment syndrome. Uh, the things that will make this worse is uh, passive range of motion or active range of motion of the ankle is going to increase the pain because remember our dorsiflexors and the muscles in the anterior compartment are going to act on the ankle and the toes. So they're going to cross the ankle joint. So moving that joint is going to shoot the pain through the roof. So remember our anatomy as well. So how are we treating this? So um, we're not really treating this, uh, especially if it's an acute thing. Um, if it's acute compartment syndrome, we're calling EMS services. We're getting them to the hospital. This is bad. We don't want that because at the hospital, if it is acute, they're going to do a fasciotomy, which means they're essentially going to cut through the fascia of the muscle, open everything up, allow the swelling to swell up and then go back down because if it keeps on swelling. It will not stop and you could lose your leg. So essentially what they're doing is opening it up to the air to allow it to breathe and then come back down. So we don't compress the nerves anymore. Because again, if we allow this to continue, we would be looking at an amputation. We don't want that. There's a bunch of people on YouTube who can talk about their experiences where they would need to have an amputation due to this. Not good. So our role is if we're seeing this happen on a patient, how can we roll out the difference between anterior compartment syndrome and something like a DVT, any sort of peripheral neuropathies or a fracture? So remember with fractures, like, like pain to palpation sort of thing, less tenderness and tightness more like pain and swelling and bruising to the area. Peripheral neuropathies, we're not seeing any swelling or anything. We're just seeing paresthesias and numbness and tingling in the extremity. DVTs, remember that is the hot, hot, hot to the touch, warm swelling, painful to the palpation. Um, and remember, a lot of these happen post-surgical. So 
If the person is treated for compartment syndrome post-surgically, we would need to work on increasing range of motion, strength, and also improving sensation. Because remember, they have the issue where they can't feel anything. So that's not good. And we would want to decrease the swelling if there's anything aware, and then keep, a, uh, that says deep aware, keep aware if the symptoms return of the syndrome. So we want to make sure that we, the patient is aware of when they should start getting concerned, when they shouldn't be concerned. We need to be aware of when it becomes something concerning or when it doesn't, especially if this is one of those chronic syndromes. So keywords, if they're mentioning any sort of these muscles in the anterior compartment, so like the tib anterior, the extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum longus, peroneus tertius, those are all the ones that we want to pay attention to because then we're thinking anterior compartment. We're seeing increased edema and swelling. That's like the hallmark signs of it. Uh, any sort of trauma, surgery, or fracture would indicate the acute um, compartment syndrome, which remember that one's the medical emergency. So we've got to be careful with that. Uh, and then we can understand that if this is the past medical history, we can think, okay, this might be a um, problematic anterior compartment syndrome. Uh, any sort of ischemia to the peroneal nerve, remember that it's the main nerve innervating all those muscles in the anterior compartment, any sort of athletic exertion, so that would be the words the boards would use, and that would indicate chronic compartment syndrome, so athletic exertion would be chronic, which is not a medical emergency in most cases, uh, and in regards to the boards, they're going to be black and white with their stuff, they're not going to have any like, ooh, could this be this or this? No, the boards like to be straightforward things. If you're making up some weird scenario in your head to make a question answer be correct, it's not the right answer. Um, tightness and tenderness. Remember that's because of the increased swelling. The skin gets very taut and tight and shiny, not good. And any sort of paresthesias or numbness could also indicate compartment syndrome because remember it's squishing the nerves and therefore we're losing sensation. It's essentially nerve entrapment by squish and swelling. So our sample question today, everybody, a physical therapist assistant is treating a patient in an outpatient physical therapy clinic following an open reduction internal fixation of their right tibia and fibula following a traumatic fall. Upon examination of the patient, the leg appears extremely swollen, red, hot, and tender to the touch. The patient also reports they have not been completing their home exercise program as prescribed. What should the therapist do next? One, send the patient to the emergency room due to suspicion of anterior compartment syndrome. Two, send the patient to the emergency room due to suspicion of a deep vein thrombosis. Three, call the patient's primary care physician and inform them of your findings. Or four, inform the physical therapist of your findings. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is number two, send the patient to the emergency room due to suspicious of a deep vein thrombosis. So we see that all of our keywords have shown up for DVTs. We got extremely swollen, red, hot, and tender to the touch. Now, if you're thinking about breathe, where we were talking about anterior compartment syndrome, what's going on? The boards will ask you about this and try to do a differential diagnosis when it comes to a DVT versus anything else. We need to make sure we're aware of a DVT. And we need to make sure we're sending this patient to the emergency room immediately. The trick question, the trick answer is to inform the physical therapist. The physical therapist might not always be there. The first step when you have a patient with a DVT is this is a life threatening emergency right now. We need to get them help. Talk to PT later. The first priority right now is getting the patient the help that they need that we cannot offer them. So we are getting them beeline there as fast as possible without any middleman. So that is why we are immediately sending the patient to the emergency room. We get them on their way to the emergency room. That's priority number one. Then we start documenting and telling everybody else what's going on. And obviously, like probably in real life, the PT will be there and you'll be able to ask them. But there are some states within this country that allow PTs to practice without being directly supervised by PT. So we need to make sure we know what to do in a situation like this, because informing the physical therapist could mean you're calling them while they're on vacation. They might not answer, trying to do something like they might not be there. We need to make sure priority number one is sending this patient to the emergency room. Now, why did I ask about a DVT when we were talking about anterior compartment syndrome? Because they do have a lot of things in common. The, the swollen, tender to the touch kind of thing. Um, but the difference is 
with a DVT, it's red hot. It's hot and it's painful to touch as well. So we would see that all of these would start saying DVT, DVT, bad, 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 not good. We can see that they had surgery. And the thing that really, really solidifies that this is probably a DVT is that the patient reports they have not been completing their home exercise program as prescribed. That means that they're not moving their leg. That means that they have been sedentary. That means that the patient has not been active. They have been immobilized. Those are all things pointing towards DVT. The boards will throw everything under the sun to make sure you identify a DVT. I talked to people who passed their boards long ago and they like don't even think about boards questions. But when I read them a question like this, they're like, oh yeah, DVT, because it's that important. So make sure you understand the difference between different pathologies and how they can relate to each other and how they could present similarly, because a DVT is one of those things that we as a PTA on a follow-up visit could be the ones catching this. It could be the one I've seen PTA send people to the ER because of DVTs. So I hope this was helpful guys, and I will see y'all in the next one. Take care.